Earhart Fingston, vice president of the NFO in the 1960s, was one of the great organizers of the National Farmers Organization. Here's some vintage Fingston as he addressed the ladies' meeting, NFO Convention, St. Louis. Here's that Fingston classic. I used to tell a story that became almost my trademark. No matter where I went, there would be members there that tell me, be sure and tell the jackass story. <laughs> now, if you've heard it, don't interrupt me because I want to hear it again myself. <laughs> I was born and raised in an area that was predominantly a wheat producing area. Two weeks, I'll be 69 years old. See, so you figure this is quite a while ago. It's about when I was 10 years old, so let's say 59 years ago. It was a wheat producing area, as I said, and in those days we didn't have trucks to haul our grain, so naturally when we harvested, we couldn't move it fast enough to the market. So we unloaded it on the farm, put it in bins and granaries, and then hauled it out in the spring and the winter of season when we had nothing else to do. Now we lived four miles from a country elevator, totally in the country. All that was there was, of course, the railroad track going through, the elevator, a depot, and an old-time country store. No highway, wasn't even on a highway. So in spring, we'd start and we'd haul the wheat to this little elevator four miles away. And at that time, we had the 50 bushel box, wagon box, held 50 bushel. Rounded them up real good and high, get on about 55 bushel. Well, we'd haul a load in the forenoon and we'd haul a load in the afternoon. And on about the same day that we were time that we started hauling our wheat, our neighbors started hauling his. And he had one of these faithful old teams of mules. A team that once they knew what you wanted them to do, they'd do it automatically. Now, some of you are old enough, you might, might remember when your dads had teams like that. Well, this is a team that this neighbor used to haul that wheat. And we'd see him go by with a load of wheat in the forenoon. We'd see him go by again with another load in the afternoon. And this kept up for about two, three days. Long about the third or fourth day, here came this team of mules from home, headed toward town with a full load of wheat on the wagon, but no driver. <laughs> Long about 10.30 or 11 o'clock, there they were coming back from town, going home, this time with an empty wagon, but still no driver. About one o'clock, lo and behold, there they were, coming back again, going to town. Another load of wheat, but still no driver. Well, my dad didn't like that very well. My brother and I were driving our teams, and we were 10 and 12 years old. My dad said that was pretty dangerous, having that team out there on the road unattended. So he went over to this neighbor to have a talk with him about it. When he got there, he said, Fred, don't you think that that's pretty risky business, sending those mules to the market with that wheat by themselves? The old neighbor looked down at feet in front of him, didn't say anything finally. He said, no, Henry, I don't think that that's dangerous. He said, you know, I went with them myself the first couple of days and I didn't get a cent more for that wheat than those jackasses that I'd gotten. As Earhart Fingston told agriculture all across the United States, don't be a jackass. We've had interesting conversations with two of NFO's top organizers recently, Oris Canerva and Anita Maxwell. Canerva speaks at farm and town meetings as a building contractor, which he now is, and as a former dairy farmer from Minnesota. He was on the NFO National Board in the 1960s. He talks about how it feels now to be a consumer. Anita Maxwell is now a dairy farmer and serves on the National Board from New York. She, being a woman, and therefore thought of as a consumer, 
talks about how it feels to be a farmer. First, that conversation with Oris Canerva, I had just asked him about his role presently as a consumer. Well, that's true, Phil. I am a consumer. Uh, I have no agricultural production, although I deal, still own some land. Um, I enjoy cheap food prices. It's interesting and, and nice to be able to go to the supermarket and come home with a food basket and only use about 16% of my net disposable income. But I'm concerned about the farmer, and the family farmer is the one that has been paying for this cheap food. And I see other people, myself included, who are enhancing our income through the use of collective bargaining. And still farmers are having such an awful time seeing how it can be done. Uh, there's no reason why farmers can't uh, improve their economic lot through the use of collective bargaining. Uh, they're, they're the only ones that can do it unless they see the, the vision and are able to work together in a unified manner they're going to disappear from the scene, as the college professors have already said. Now, Oris, as a building contractor, you're in an industry that's very much influenced by collective bargaining, aren't you? Uh, this is true. Uh, we deal with uh, union people at all, at all times. And an interesting thing to me is that when I went back in the business with my son in 73, we were contracting, just for illustration, we were contracting brickwork at uh, $160 a thousand. Now we're getting almost $300 a thousand. All of this because of increase in costs and increase in labor due to collective bargaining. Uh, in the, the same period of time, uh, farmers have not had an increase in their income to speak of, and as in the case of grain, they're now getting less for wheat than they were in 73. That was Horace Canerva, who billed himself as a consumer, which he is, and also, he described how collective bargaining affects his present construction business. Women are often thought of as, quote, the consumer, but Anita Maxwell, NFO board member from New York, thinks of herself as a farmer as well as a consumer. Oh, yes. There, you know, we have women in our neighborhood right in New York State. Uh, you know, one instance, two girls that are shipping milk through NFO, they're... they're uh, not married, and they're single ladies, probably in their late 40s, and they operate a farm without any male help at all. And I know of others that are widows or divorcees that are operating farms. And in my own case, uh, uh, just just been the last few years to, since two of our married sons have taken over and help us uh, full time on the farm. I went to the barn every night and morning and milked the cows right along with my husband. I plowed, I baled hay. There just is no job on the farm that I haven't done. And I raised my family while I did it. We worked terribly hard. And I think perhaps that's why I fight so hard for farmers' rights, uh, because I've been there. I know what it is, and I know we should get a fair price. It's, it was a pretty hard pill to swallow when I lived in an old, broken-down farmhouse without even decent plumbing. And I would have my cousins or relatives visit us from town, and they had a new home and two or three bathrooms and new car. And I was working three times as hard as those women were. And it was a pretty hard pill to swallow. That's when I decided something sh has got to be done. If I work this hard, I ought to get rewarded for it, too, just like they do. Today, we heard from Oris Canerva and Anita Maxwell, two of the top speakers for the National Farmers Organization. Canerva's point that collective bargaining, as he works with it in the construction business, really justifies Maxwell's point that the farmer needs to organize too. With all the government figures saying we're going to have more hog numbers than expected, the hog division of the National Farmers Organization has announced what they call a sow sell-off. I have the top men in the hog division of the NFO here, Merle Sunken, who is supervisor of volume for the collection points, Roger Blank, a negotiator, and Alan Scraw, head of the hog division. I'm going to ask each one of them, what is this sow sell-off, Merle Sunken? Well, Phil, this sow sell-off will be nothing more than a reduction of each producer's uh, herd out here in the country, a small reduction, because if we're figuring uh, that the USDA figures show that our national slaughter figures are approximately 74 to 80 million head of slaughter hogs per year, they're estimating right now that we're going to have a pig crop report of from 12 to 17 percent increase. So that means that the hog producers out here should decline their sow herds approximately 440,000 head of sows for the next annual year and at that rate uh, just a few sows from each fellow's herd will definitely take care of that problem, Phil. Why is this a good idea, Roger Blank? 
Well, we've had a very stabilized market, I think, in this past calendar year of 1978, and probably the most attractive. Uh, but with a 12 to 17 percent increase that Merle just mentioned, uh, this is going to be burdensome, especially in certain areas where there have been many packers uh, close some of their plants because of inefficiencies and outdated the uh, operations. And this will leave producers in these areas uh, wanting for a market. And it's already evident in the commodity exchange futures market. It is very pessimistic, very bearish, and I believe the only way we can turn that market around and afford all hog producers the opportunity of selling hogs on a forward contract basis at a break-even or a profitable level is to reduce these uneconomical type of sows. Well, Roger, what are some of these inefficient practices? Phil, we're seeing evidence in several states, uh, especially around the auctions, um, where producers are, the, those efficient producers anyway, are selling off the inefficient sows and someone else is uh, picking up this inefficient sow, taking it about back to the farm, breeding it, and uh, also we're seeing evidence of gilts being sold on the open market, uh, maybe for 50 to 75 cents over the cash market, only to be returned to the country, and this is going to add to the, uh, the market problems. Turn now to Alan Scraw, head of the hog division. Do you think, Alan, that hog producers generally can work together and get a job like this done? Yes, by organizing, organized producers have got the capability to do it. Every producer, member or non-member, should be concerned about the effect that a $35 to $40 price will have on their cash flow, and the community leaders should be concerned about what it'll do to the tax base in that particular county. Alan, are you appealing just to NFO members or to all hog producers? Now, I realize that non-members cannot legally participate in this program. However, in the new hog division, non-members may join on a commodity agreement for only one year and participate in this sow sell-off and help stabilize their hog market. As far as the members are concerned, they should immediately call their local collection point manager or the local National Farmers Organization representative and put together a sow block in their area, bargained for and sold through the organization to various markets. Well, Alan, can they do it? Yes. Look at it this way. What we've been talking about is common sense. In the National Farmers Organization, we know hog producers can price their hogs because we've done it. We can stabilize the hog price and avoid a price disaster in 1979 if we work together. Yes, what Alan Straw observed, that this sow sell-off is common sense, is a point every hog producer concedes. NFO is offering its nationwide structure to do it effectively. Phil Allen for NFO News. And that for today is something to think about.